hi guys welcome back to another youtube video it's your tutor disha today i'll be answering the first three questions of the csec biology june 2021 paper two and the first question says name two raw materials and state two conditions that are necessary for photosynthesis the raw materials necessary for photosynthesis are carbon dioxide and water and the conditions necessary for photosynthesis include the availability of sunlight, which provides energy for the process, and an optimum temperature for the enzymes involved to function best. B. Figure 1 is a drawing of a leaf. On the grid provided, make a drawing of the leaf that is twice the size of figure 1. You are going to increase this drawing by a factor of 2 using the graph sheet provided. On the diagram drawn above, label each of the following parts of the leaf. Apex, lamina, midrib, petiole. C says the leaf shown in figure one is from a plant that grew in very windy conditions. Suggest one way in which the leaf is adapted for each of the following functions. Gaseous exchange and for preventing excess water loss. All right, guys, what is gaseous exchange and how is the leaf adapted for this? The gaseous exchange describes the exchange of gases, which we know are carbon dioxide and oxygen. And the leaf is adapted for this process by having large intercellular air spaces to house carbon dioxide, specifically in the spongy mesophyll layer. Another way how the leaf is adapted for gaseous exchange is it, the leaf is normally thin. Right, And this means that the gases can reach their destinations via diffusion quickly. So the leaf is adapted for preventing excess water loss by manufacturing a waterproof substance called waxicuticle. And what the waxicuticle does, it helps the leaf to retain water. We can also talk about how the stomata has guard cells. And the guard cells... They have an opening and closing mechanism depending on the conditions. D. Green plants can produce food by photosynthesis. Suggest three reasons why there is still a need for them to store food. So even though green plants are the autotropes in the ecosystem, it is essential for them to retain food for one, respiration, which we know the plants use the sugars, and oxygen to produce energy and the energy is used to drive several processes in the in the plant for example the loading of sugars in the phloem and you learn more about that when you get to cake biology secondly sugars are used for storage and development of plant organs like stem tubers root tubers Sugars are even used to attract pollinators. Did you know that? Sugars are used to make a fluid that we call nectar. And this nectar will attract insects so that the pollination process can be facilitated. What else? All right. We can also talk about how sugars are used to make plant constituents like the cell wall. As a matter of fact, many glucose molecules made from photosynthesis are joined to make a polysaccharide called cellulose where do we find cellulose again that's right cellulose is found in the cell wall all right e suggests three reasons why the initial carbohydrate product of photosynthesis which is glucose is not stored in green leaves so to answer this question you'll have to think about the properties of glucose it is a reactive sugar, it is highly soluble, and it is responsive to osmosis. Plants store food as starch as opposed to glucose because starch is insoluble. Glucose will dissolve into the various parts of the cell. It is reactive means that it will take part in the various metabolic processes in the cell. All right, F, describe the test that could be used to determine if green leaf has stored starch. So to test if green leaf has stored starch, one would have to first 
boil it in water. Why do we do this? We boil it because we want to kill the leaf, right? Stopping all the chemical reactions and most importantly, break down the cell wall so that the iodine can penetrate those starch molecules if present. We add the leaf to a test tube containing ethanol in a water bath. Why? To decolorize it, right? Or remove the chlorophyll. Thirdly, we rehydrate the leaf. You can rehydrate it with cold water. Next, you test. You place the leaf on a clear tile. One can see what will happen. And then you add, what is the name of the starch reagent? Iodine, right? You add iodine from a drop-in pipette on the leaf. And then next, you observe if the iodine on the leaf changes from brown to black or blue-black, then that will indicate that the leaf has stored starch. G. Unlike plants, animals must ingest complex substances, then break these down by mechanical and chemical digestion. Explain two ways in which the human digestive system is adapted for the mechanical digestion of food. All right, students. What is mechanical digestion? So mechanical digestion involves the physical breakdown of food into smaller pieces. It is adapted because it possesses structures that help with this process. Structures like the teeth. What are the different types of teeth? You have the incisors that we use to bite in food, the canine for tearing, the molars and the premolars for crushing, right? Along with the teeth, we, we have structures like the tongue and the palate that helps to mix and roll the food into a bolus so it can send it to the other parts of the digestive system for chemical digestion. We can talk about the structures of the alimentary canal like the stomach, right? The stomach has strong muscular walls to churn or mix the food with the enzymes, right? And there are several other adaptations of the human digestive system that you could talk about. All right, number two, define the term pollination. Simple guys, pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther to the stigma. B, describe how male gametes reach female gametes in humans. The male gamete is called the sperm and the female gamete is called the egg. Now to meet the egg, the sperm must travel from the testes to the female reproductive system. And this is facilitated during the process of sexual intercourse. During sexual intercourse, semen containing sperm is ejaculated into the vagina, which travels up to the uterus and to the oviducts where it meets the egg. We don't need to talk about what happens next like fertilization and implantation because they only ask us how does the male gamete re the reach the female gametes. C. Figure 2 shows the female part of a flower in which the petals, sepals and stamens have been removed. Label each of the following parts on the diagram. Stigma, style, ovary and ovule. Now I know some of you messed up on this part especially the ovary and the ovule part right we know that the stigma is the top part of the female flower right it's normally sticky and it collects pollen grains so this is the stigma this long stalk like structure that holds up the stigma is called the style and it is actually where the pollen tube will grow down to the ovary right the ovary now houses the ovule and will become the fruit so this is the ovary this entire part is the ovary the ovule now is where the egg is located and no some of you can draw that this part is the ovule not so this entire region is the ovule and it is made up of different parts like the polar nuclei the integuments the d Explain why a human embryo does not have a large nutrient stores, but a plant embryo does. So a plant embryo found in the seed is not annexed to the parent plant. They are dispersed elsewhere to be germinated into a new plant. 
right? So the nutrient stores will therefore supply energy for the embryo to develop until it can germinate and produce its own food by photosynthesis. But in contrast to the human embryo, it is annexed to the mother, right? It does not need to have large nutrient stores because it obtains nutrients from the mother through the placenta. And E suggests four reasons why a couple would be advised to use the permanent method of birth control for the male rather than the permanent method of birth control for the female. So first we need to ask ourselves, what is the name of the permanent method of birth control for the male? And what is the name of the permanent birth control for the female? And then we need to think about what are the effects or the consequences that might have arise after each party has done this procedure, right? So for the men, it's called vasectomy. And for the female, it's called tubal ligation. And a couple would be advised to use the permanent method of birth control for the male because one, it's safer. The female anatomy and the male anatomy. When a doctor can easily slit the scrotum and tie the tubes, for the female, it's a more tedious process, right? You have to visit the reproductive system via surgery. That could pose a risk for damaging other organs or cause an infection um, in the female reproductive system. For the female, we could talk about the risks associated. Risk of ectopic pregnancy, which is due to a possibility of an incomplete closure of the fallopian tubes, right? Thirdly, you could talk about financial aspect here that the vasectomy is inexpensive compared to tubal ligation. And lastly, recovery period. The main aim of birth control is to delay pregnancy to continue sexual intercourse. So here we could talk about how the recovery period is faster for males. And those are some of the reasons why a couple would be advised to use the permanent method of birth control. Number three, figure three is a diagram of a terrestrial food web. What does terrestrial mean? Land, right? So a food web found on land. And A, using the food web illustrated in figure three, identify a producer, a predator, and a primary consumer. So we know that the producer is the organism that makes their own food. The grass is a producer. Wildflowers, they are producers. So wildflowers or grass. Predator, the predator is the organism that preys on another. The hawk, right? And the primary consumer is the organism that feed on plants or producers. And the rabbit is an example here. Then B, state two roles of the producer in the food web. So the producer's roles include harvesting energy from the sun, yes, and using it to make food. They are the only organism capable of doing that. And that energy is going to be used to sustain the food web, make food or energy available to consumers further up in the food web. And C, identify one biotic and one abiotic factor that would affect the organisms shown in figure three. Questions you need to ask yourself, what are biotic and abiotic factors? Biotic factors are the living components of the ecosystem. What could be a biotic factor that could affect this food web? Presence of invasive species, and these are the non-native organisms that don't belong in the ecosystem don't belong in the food web and when they enter this food web then they could become new predators competing with the hawk or the snake for their food right and then abiotic factors are the non-living things or conditions that influence organisms temperature or the availability of water then i explain why there are fewer organisms at the top than at the bottom of the food web. Each level of the food web is called a trophic level. In fact, as we move from trophic level to trophic level, energy decreases. And with less energy available, there's going to be fewer organisms available. 
discuss two possible consequences of the hawk becoming extinct in the ecosystem shown in figure three. So what they're asking you is what would happen if the hawk is no longer available? The hawk is a predator, right? Then the preys will no longer be eaten by it. And the population of the preys, what will happen to them? They will increase, right? Also, biological relationships like competition that was between the snake and the hawk, you'd have more primary consumers available in the second trophic level with more primary consumers available then that creates a strain on the first trophic level right they will be feeding on the producers more lastly suggest two reasons why decomposers are important organisms in all food webs what are decomposers again guys decomposers are organisms that break down dead organic matter and when they do this they release the inorganic materials which have been fixed into organic materials and will be reintroduced to the environment. Now, plants can use these inorganic materials during the process of assimilation. So these inorganic materials can return to the cycles found in the ecosystem, like the nitrogen cycle. And it is through doing this that the decomposers keep the environment clean and remove dead and decaying plants and animals all right guys thank you so much for watching and stay tuned for number three four and five